This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 354 of the Stable Scoop Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network. Please support our sponsors as they make this show possible. Our sponsors this week are Buy Me to Dewormers and Dr. Rose's Remedies. Helene and I have the week off, but don't worry, we'll be back again next week. This week we thought we would visit the Go Back Machine for a fun episode from 2011 that we called I Hung Up That Grizzly Today. We spoke with our hero, Erin Bolster, about her amazing story, Saving a Young Boy from a Grizzly Bear Attack. Plus, we hear from the author of the poem, I Hung Up My Bridal Today, a tech pick and our tack and habit product. Listen in as we go back in time for one of our favorites. Welcome to the stable school with weekly shows delivered right to you. With Helena and Glenn the Geek, live from the stable, it's every week. They bring you the news through hail or high water while using their tails as their own fly swatters. So sit on down and laugh till your poop, cause it's time again for stable school. Stable scoop, stable scoop, stable scoop. This is Glenn the Geek. And this is Helena B. And you're listening to the Stable Scoop Radio Show on the Horse Radio Network. Well, howdy, Helena. It seems like forever since I've talked to you. It, it has been forever. So much has happened since you and Jen went on vacation and... Oh, I have lots to talk about today. Oh, good, good. Yeah, we 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 went on vacation up to the down to Pigeon Forge in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. Got to hang out with uh, Dolly. Dolly and I, you know, we hung out together, and she sang a little. And you hung out with. Wait, okay. First of all, you saw Dolly Parton in person. No, it was just pivot. Oh, because um, I think she's pretty cool. I would be kind of psyched. Like, I there's know. Very, there's there's very few like non horse people who would render me starstruck, but Dolly Parton is one of them. Yeah, I know she. That would be cool, but I don't think she hangs out down there too much okay. anymore. Mm. Uh, but I'll tell you that area would not be would not be there to the degree it is with the number of tourists that come into there without Dolly. Uh, she definitely is the reason that uh, that area got built up so much. Going to Gatlinburg, it's, you'd love it. It's just like being at the beach, on the boardwalk at the beach, with all the little shops and, and selling you know, uh, hard candy and you know, just a taffy and all that stuff. Hmm. It's just like being at the beach with all the little cheesy shops, and, but it's in the middle of the Smoky Mountains. You know? That's right. pretty cool. What, I guess what would you call it? I mean, you can't really call it a boardwalk. You could call it like the cabin walk or something. Or yeah, the, exactly. Uh, we wanted to go tra- ziplining. but oh, zip lining, yeah, yeah. We, we never got ziplining. It rained every day. So the times we were going to go zip lining, we didn't get to do it. But we did go four wheeling. Got to take the ATVs out. And Jennifer said if she did that, which, by the way, which was beautiful up the side of a mountain and a lot of fun, um, if she did that, then I had to go on a trail ride. So oh, so you did the ATV first? Yes, we did the ATV first, and then I was committed to doing a trail ride. Of and course, we did. Committed. We did a trail ride with Walden's Creek Stables, which was great. Uh, we had a great guide, and he, his name is Chance, and he took us out at the side of the, the mountain. The guy's name is Chance? Yeah, his name is That's Chance. That's cool. That's yep. cool. That's his middle name, actually. And, uh, he was great. He's a trick rider uh, and a Roman rider, and he was working there. But his brother actually travels the country doing trick and Roman riding for rodeos. Oh. Uh, so okay. neat guy and took us up. We went uh, on the side of a mountain there and, and up, up steep hills and down steep hills. No, you were like really on the side of a mountain. This isn't like the foothills of Kentucky. No. This is like the mountains in Tennessee. <laughs> it was pretty mountainous. And it was muddy because it had rained all week. So, But these horses, I'll tell you what, they kept their feet under them. They're, they're used to doing that. And, and what kind of horses were they? Quarter horses or yeah, gated horses? A quarter horse. I had a standard bread. Oh, okay. Well, uh, wait, a standard bread or a standard bread? Yes, I did. And That's awesome. Tall, skinny guy. Um, gated, if we ever got that fast, which wait, we did. Wait, wait. Tall, skinny guy, gated? Isn't that saddle bread? Glenn. Oh, Glenn. You no, know, there was an argument. He <laughs> said standard bread, and Jennifer thought saddle bread. But he kept insisting it was a standard bread because standard <sighs> breads can be gated too. Um, well, but but yeah. we never got past walk, so I'm not quite sure what gates he had. Okay, <laughs> so. all right. I, 
You I'm going to go a lot with of trotting on these hills. I'm going to side with Jennifer, but okay. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so so she was on a quarter. All right, so you're on these still great horses who put their feet in all the right places, which yeah, thank God for them. Which is the important part. <laughs> now, did you enjoy yourself? Yes, I did actually. I had a good time. Um, you know, and for new listeners, I'm a driver. I drive carriages. I don't necessarily ride a lot. So for me to go, we call to he's called America's horse husband yes, for a reason. Exactly, um, put me behind it, and they had a carriage there. I said, "Can I just take that?" And they said, "Oh, it'd be a little rough on these trails," and it would have been. But it was fun. I actually, after about an hour and a half, I I was done though. About you know, I had a big western saddle, one of the roping saddles with the big horn. Yeah, yeah. Did, did it have a cushy seat though? Well, you're pretty sore when you get off after. You know. <laughs> so no. <laughs> Jennifer wanted to do the four hour ride. I said, "God bless you. Go ahead." I love um, that she's like totally going <laughs> hard back into riding. She's going hard. But she had a great little horse. And, and at the end of the ride, the guide said, oh, you are the best person that's ever been on that horse. You're the only one because her horse wanted to eat the whole time. And they had a little discussion right at the beginning. And I guess the horse realized she knew what she was doing. So he didn't do it. And he said that you're the first one that ever rode that horse successfully. So... Your, your woman can ride. I know. I mean, she can, and like nobody's business, she can ride. And she does it so subtly. Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do later in the show. Talk about taking that rides with guides. There's a place called Swan Mountain Outfitters out uh, in the Rocky Mountains. And there's a guide out there who made herself a hero this week. And we call her the Grizzly Wrangler. And we're going to tell you why in a minute when we let you hear a recording that we did on the morning show. But... Well, she's coming up. And then also, before, you know, two weeks ago, you read a poem that made everybody cry called I Hung Up My Bridal Today. And we're going to replay that today for everybody that missed it. But we have the author of that poem on today. And she has a story to tell about writing that poem. Uh, and she was so excited. She said she cried when she heard your rendition. Of it. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I, t- I had to tell everybody that I, I, it did take me many takes to record that because I did like the first three or four, I was all choked up and then, and then I would only choke up on like one line. And of course being the anal retentive perfectionist that I am, I couldn't even do that with one line. So <laughs> I would say it really, it took me about 800 t- tries, <laughs> but th- that's I'm honored that it moved her so much. That's she nice. Loved it. She loved it, and she so much so that she wanted to come on the show today and give you a thank you, and, and we want to find out from her the story behind that because it was so moving. Yeah, yeah. It really was. So tell me about, you're, you're still in recovery, and uh, you're new. Holy you're cow. Married? You guys, uh, so much happens. Whenever, whenever anybody goes on vacation, so much happens in my life. My knee is getting better very, very slowly, but very consistently improving, yes. Um, I'm not yet cleared to ride, but I, the leg is getting stronger. I'm not, uh, I wouldn't consider myself disabled anymore because I, I can now dump wheelbarrows full of manure. Um, but you wouldn't want to go on that ride with us last week. I can tell you. <laughs> no, I, I can't. I, I can't. Okay. So I'm going to be really, I'm going to see if I can like tick off all these things. Okay. So it turns out that while I was laid up and Peter was taking care of my horses, Pi apparently bonded with him. So... We've been putting our horses out in the back pasture now that the weather is cooler and we're letting our front pasture rest. And so when I walk the horses out back, Pi is always like, he walks ahead of me, he gets in my space, you know, and I do all the right things. I do all the Monty things, right, to keep this horse in his space and well-behaved. Well, Peter's been helping me put the horses out back because I'm still a little shaky on the knee. He holds pie and the horse's head just drops to the ground. He's like two paces behind Peter, completely relaxed, turns around quietly. He unhooks the lead rope. Horse just trots away gently. I'm like, (laughs) hello. (laughs) You 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 now own an Arab saddlebred cross. Congratulations. (laughs) So basically your horse hates you. I don't think he hates me, but I do think that there is something about Peter's way his demeanor which is very yeah, simple and relaxed a, he's like type c yes and yeah. <laughs> you know it goes back to what wendy said about yeah. fire and earth and all that stuff and um you know peter's way of going is just it just puts pie at ease it's just really nice it's not that he's ill at ease with me it's just that we're both jacked up well you know? as she said you're both you know you, you 
when she read both of you, when Dr. Wendy Ying read both of you with the Chinese uh, elements, yeah. she said you two are not a match. <laughs> no, it's, it's like we said, we don't butt heads, but um, it's very interesting to walk, to see my horse, uh, my husband handle my horse and say, wow, that's how he should be behave. That's how he should feel all the time. So that was kind of an interesting revelation. Um, then what else? Oh, so yeah. Is he riding him yet? Not yet. What we're... We're considering it, but to f- because Pi is so short backed, it'd be difficult to find a saddle that's big enough uh, to yeah. fit Peter that Peter's doesn't interfere. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, Pi is strong enough to handle it, but like I said, that saddle would go would reach back into the loin area that could be a problem. Well, let's clarify that uh, Peter's a tall guy. He's not a big. He's no. He's he's, he's dense too, guy. though. He's yeah, but... he's six feet tall, but he's about two hundred pounds. Now yeah. he's lean. He doesn't have any fat, but he's really dense. He's you know muscular. That's um, the way Helena likes him. It is. Oh, <laughs> it is. I know. He's such a cutesy pie. So he finished my barn for me. He, we have all the wood up on the wall that was that still had like house wrapping on it, the Tarvec, Tyvek paper. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the inside. So he put all the tongue and groove wood, and he put a door in between the barn and the kitchen of the, the guest house. Look at you go. Big deal. And then, last but not least... Uh, this weekend, I actually volunteered for the Westport Hunter Pace, which was not too far from Little Compton, and it's put on by the Norfolk Hunt Club. Great, great bunch of people. The most amazing route for a Hunter Pace I've ever seen. Hmm. Crazy. Like, Jennifer needs to fly out here next year <laughs> and do this Hunter Pace. It's stunning. It's wow. really nice. And Is I get it along to do- the ocean? It is. It's along the ocean, oh, but wow. it's all through like farms and, um, you know, there's stone walls and open meadows and woods. And then you go along the now, west. This port- is Rhode Island near where you live, right? It's actually just over the border in Massachusetts. So my town and Westport are they abut each other and they're divided by the state line. Oh, OK. So technically it's Massachusetts, but it's just one town over. And so, um, yeah, so I got to mix with some, you know fox hunting people and that was really fun and i did the road crossing so you know i got to put my hand up in traffic and make people stop for horses and i love you love the power don't you i do i do i love forcing respect you are so type a (laughs) so that's yeah and that's what we got well cool that sounded like fun it was a really, yeah. You know, and they feed you. That's the fun thing about Hunter Paces is they always get you good lunches. Wow, Hunter Paces are fun. They're sort of laid back, too. They're not, you know, it's not, uh, it's not a three-day event where everybody's no. stressing out. No, it's, it's very, very laid back. Well, Jennifer and I tomorrow are going to be in the Georgetown Horse Parade. Uh, Georgetown, Kentucky, next town up next to the Kentucky Horse Park. Every year they do, they have a festival of the horse. And every year they do a horse parade where a couple hundred horses get together and go through town in an actual parade. So we're going to doing that with uh, Dr. Yang, with Wendy. She's going to be driving a, a unicorn hitch, which is two horses and then one horse in the front. Oh, uh, cool. And so she wanted to, wondered if we'd go along, and we said, sure. You know, Jennifer's so going to get along. back of a carriage in yeah, a parade? Until we heard that she said, oh, but I, did I tell you I've never driven a unicorn hitch before? <laughs> So, oh, you're kidding me. Like, and you're doing it in the parade? And she said, oh, I'll be no problem. I can drive I, four. How hard could three be? <laughs> there's something about Wendy that makes me think she's right. Like, yes. I, I, I don't know what it is about her, but she can do anything. It's like, here, Wendy, can you, like, you know, can you cure cancer? Or can you, like, you know. And she'll try anything. She does I not. know. And she'll do it. And you just think, oh, Wendy will do it. Wendy will get it done. <laughs> so that's tomorrow. So we're doing that tomorrow. And actually, I'm heading up with uh, Wendy we're going to the Martin's Carriage Auction, which is one of the largest carriage auctions in the world had held every fall in Pennsylvania, where I grew up. Uh, Jennifer and I used to go there, and we're going to head up and actually do the driving radio show from the carriage auction. Oh, that's nice. Uh, yeah, that's so really you'll nice. be able to hear the auctioneer in the background and everything, and, and they sell the expensive carriage. They, you know, yeah, Je- I remember Jennifer used to tell me about those auctions. She had great stories to tell about all the auctions, not just the carriage auctions, but all that horse stuff. I don't even call it horse stuff. All that farm living yes. off the land stuff that happens in Pennsylvania. Well, we, 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 you know, outfitted our whole barn, our whole big farm with uh, out of public auctions because in that neck of the woods, they have public auctions every weekend. 
Yeah. And they'll sell off the farms. And we've got our equipment that way and, you know, everything we got that way pretty much. Mm. Uh, so it's fun. I love auctions. There's nothing better than bidding, you know, and winning. <laughs> Nothing so better. you don't care what you get. You just no, want to win. No, I could be one of those people with all the junk out back, but you, yeah, you just don't I, have the money for it. You totally would be too. I, you would have, I could see you at like three o'clock in the morning with like one of those beams on your head, working over a little workbench out in the back, <laughs> you know, like bzz, bzz, little buzzing noises coming and <laughs> barbecue grill, ribs on the barbecue for breakfast. That's right. <laughs> all right. Well, let's get this week underway here. Um, we, our first guest we have coming up, it, you're going to hear was a recording we're going to play for you from the Horses in the Morning show. And her name is Erin Bolster. And she led, she leads trail rides. She's a wrangler, what they call a wrangler, just like that we had down in Pigeon Forge last week. And she takes out people who don't know a darn thing about riding horses into the mountains. And this happens to be at the edge of the Rocky Mountains. And, you know, she has an amazing story to tell, and I'm not going to go any further than that other than you're going to want to hear this. We all, Jennifer, Jamie, and I had goosebumps listening to her tell this story. All of us. We were writing to each other. We, we text during the show, and we were writing, I have goosebumps, and I was like, I do too. <laughs> <laughs> so, and what an amazing, brave hero of a person. She's terrific. And she's going to get some national publicity here very shortly. You'll hear about that, too. So let's listen to Erin Bolster. And this is my co-host, Jamie Jennings, and I interviewing her on The Morning Show. And thank God we got her. Jennifer did a great job in just securing this interview. We had some competition. But first, you were talking about cold, Helena. Is it starting to get chilly there in Rhode Island? Um, no. Well, we're <laughs> supposed to have 30 degrees here in the morning by Saturday. So I'll tell you what, that starts to make me think about sheets. And last week one day, because it rained so much and got so chilly here, we actually had to put a blanket on Beaker. Wow. So, you know, you're going to be going out to the barn, you're going to be digging out your blankets, and you're going to be getting 10 pounds of dust off from the summertime because you haven't even looked at them. And you said you were going to clean them, and you didn't do that. So you're going to go out, and you're digging them out of the pile, and you're going to look at them, and they're going to have big holes in them, and you're going to go, oh, geez, I need new blankets. Well, we know where you need to go, and that's equestriancollections.com. They have tons of brands of different blankets. You're going to find what you need from light to medium to heavy to just a sheet. Whatever you need, you're going to find it at equestriancollections.com. And that always happens. Am I wrong about that, Helena? You say at the end of winter, I'm going to put the blanket over here. I'm going to get it cleaned over oh, yeah. the summer. Oh, yeah. And yeah. it's going to be ready to go yeah. for the first cold. Mine and, still aren't back. <laughs> Well, you at least brought yours. It's true. It's <laughs> Most true. people, like us, it's laying in the barn someplace covered in about a pound of hair and dust. And then you get it out and you go, oh, man, I was meant to clean that. But now it's cold, so you don't have time. So, and Or you look at it and you just realize it's just shot. Well, no matter where, what kind of blanket you need, you're going to find it at equestriancollections.com. Go there first. Give it a try. All right. Let's hear the story of the amazing Grizzly Wrangler. Uh, yeah, she's kind of a, uh, a big deal. Erin uh, Bolster, we call her the Grizzly Bear Wrangler. She's not just a horse wrangler. She's a Grizzly Bear Wrangler. She worked for Swan Mountain Outfitters, and we'd like to say t uh, good morning to Erin. How are you? Good morning. I'm wonderful. How are you guys? Well, well, we're doing fantastic, and we're so glad to talk to you because – we feel like at sometimes when there's a big breaking news story that we, 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 because our show's in the morning, we kind of head off some big names. We got you before who? What are you doing later today? Uh, well, it's not later today. Uh, later today I have a local news interview, but uh, on Tuesday of next week I'm going to be on Letterman. Uh, <laughs> probably Tuesday. It's not a firm schedule yet. We're, we're still working on some logistics as to whether Tonk is also going to be making an appearance. Oh, oh you're trying to get... yes. oh, That's great. That's <laughs> awesome. Congratulations. So, thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's fantastic. I'm sure you had no idea, but let's let's back up a little bit and let's start from the beginning and tell everybody, just tell everybody your story and what happened. Absolutely. Um, well, like you said, I work for Swan Mountain Outfitters, and we're based out of West Glacier, Montana, which is right outside of Glacier National Park. Uh, and we do have a large bear population in that area, both grizzly bears and black bears, and we see both frequently on the trails. It's not an unusual experience. 
But usually it's very calm and peaceful. The bears continue eating or they just wander off into the woods. Um, but on the morning of this incident, I, I was taking a trail ride out. I had eight guests with me. Uh, it was actually two separate families. It was a father and his son from Northern California and a family of six from Illinois. And so we were going out on the trail. It was just going to be a one-hour uh, ride, which is actually the shortest ride we offer at that corral. And we rode out about 10 to 15 minutes, and we got to this point in the trail where most of the trail is lodgepole pine. It's very open. You can see a long way. But this is a little more closed in. There's a lot more bushes and huckleberry bushes and serviceberry bushes that are hiding the view. And my horse, Tonk, he just froze, and he wouldn't move, and that's very unusual for him. And about two seconds after he did that and he froze and looked off into the woods, this little spike buck deer ran straight toward us, and the deer actually hit my horse in the left front shoulder, and then the deer mm. continued running down the line of horses that was behind me in the trail. And a few seconds after that happened, I saw why the deer was running so panicked directly toward us, which, is, of course, is the wrong direction that deer usually run. And it was because mm -hmm. he had about a 700-pound grizzly bear right behind him. Oh. Um, and yeah. <laughs> uh, we would had a very late winter, and our huckleberry bushes were not ripe yet. Uh, none of the berries were out, and our bears were really hungry. Um, they're not typically big game hunters. It's not their thing. Uh, but this bear was hunting. He wanted a deer. He was, he was very hungry. <laughs> and so when that happened, the boy right behind me was a little eight-year-old boy, and he was riding a horse named Scout. And Scout's a phenomenal horse, has worked with us for years, always been a very trusted child mount, and still is. Uh, but when the deer hit him after he hit my horse, it turned Tonk to the right. The bear and the deer were coming from the left. And all the other horses behind Scout turned around directly on the trail and went back toward home. But Scout, who had turned 90 degrees to the right because of the deer was now running directly into the woods um but the deer went with the other seven down the trail so the bear's focus shifted from the deer to scout and scout became the new prey uh. oh, God. and yeah so the bear took off after scout never really stopped actually he just continued right on chasing and just shifted his attention to scout and at that point all the other horses and people were running the other direction and I had to turn Tonk back toward the bear and run at the bear, and I kind of cut the angle from the way it, it happened, and I was able to get between Scout and the bear. And the bear had tunnel vision. He did not even see me or the big white horse at first. Um, he just saw Scout, and he saw hunger. So he was chasing Scout, and I got between them and turned directly toward the bear, and at that point we were about 35 feet apart, maybe a little more, and then I char he was charging directly at me, so I charged directly at him, and we got about a little less than 10 feet apart from each other, and at that point he finally called chicken, and he spun off to the left, um, tonk stopped, and the bear started to do another circle around, because at this point, right behind me, the boy had at this point fallen off of Scout. Scout's training had kicked back in, and he froze the second the boy fell and was standing next to the boy. But the bear was circling back around to come, still try to get either Scout or the boy. At this point, I don't know what he was focused on. Um, and so I had to turn Tonk toward him again and charge at him again. And this one was more of a side-on. I charged him on the side and chased him. And finally, he turned and started running away and he finally continued running away and I went back, picked up the boy, put him on talk, got on with him and we went back and found his dad and found the rest of the people. <laughs> okay, so oh my was... God, my entire body is covered in goosebumps right at this moment. I mean, just to hear you talk about the bear circling back around, the boy is on the ground. What is going through your head at that moment? Uh, I just, it was not an option in my head to let the boy get hurt. I didn't know how all of it was going to go, 
but I knew that that bear's attention had to be shifted to me, that whatever happened, it was going to be me and Tonk and that bear and not that boy and scout and the bear. Um, wow. Do they train you at all for this? Do they tell you what to do during a bear attack? Do you have bear repellent with you? I mean, um, so there's never actually been an, a, a charge, an attack on a group of people on horses by a bear until this day in Montana. Bears are generally scared of horses. So it had never entered anyone's mind that we would be chased by a bear in a predatory way. It, it had never really happened. Um, so there was no training for that. We certainly had training uh, for how to deal with bears that we saw, uh, you know, that were just a little territorial, but never in this sense. Um, we do carry bear spray whenever we're going to be on the ground. Uh, we do offer lunch rides and stuff like that. And, of course, we have bear spray then because we're on the ground, we're vulnerable. But when you're on the horse, generally <laughs> – the bears see you as a very large animal, and they avoid you. Um, mm -hmm. So there was no specific training for this, no. So hey, can, okay. I ask, can I ask a question here, Jamie? I'm a yeah. Percheron lover. Let's talk a little bit about your horse, because, you know, we've owned large Percherons before. And, you know, first of all, did you have any doubts that your horse Tonk, which was a very large cross, Percheron, I think, uh, quarter horse cross, right? Um, we're guessing on the quarter horse cross. He's very obviously Percheron, um, but we don't know what else is in there. He, um, he doesn't have any papers, and the man I ended up buying him from had just bought him previously from another, uh, you know, Wrangler operation, so okay. he doesn't come with a complete history. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, he has a, he has feet the size of pipe lace, so he's a Percheron. You know, there's no question about that. He's very intimidating, very powerful looking. Did you have any doubts that he would he would do this for you? I mean, he could have turned and bolted back too, and it, with the horse that big, you ain't stopping him. Exactly. No, I, as soon as I turned him and, and kicked him, and I didn't even have to actually kick him that hard. I turned him and pointed him at that bear, and he he knew what I wanted, and he never hesitated. Um, but I remember thinking, "Thank God I'm on Tonk," because many other horses would not have done it. Um, but Tonk had always been there. He'd never refused me anything, and he he was there that day. I didn't really have time to doubt whether he'd do it. Uh, I just had to ask him and see what happened, and um, thank God he did. Oh, wow. So you you get on this, this awesome horse. You go galloping over. You have this whole ordeal. You pick up the boy. You put him on the horse. You get him back to his family, and, and I was reading – Kind of what happened to you and Tonk after that whole thing kind of settled down? What 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 happened with you and, and, and Tonk? Well, um, after it all settled down, we went back to the barn, of course. But eventually, um, I, I've obviously bought Tonk uh, at this time, and I knew I knew that day that I, I had to buy Tonk. <laughs> so I contacted <laughs> his owner uh, and, uh, and and bought him. He was he was more than happy to sell him to me after hearing all the story, and he wanted me to have him very badly too. So uh, his previous owner Scott was is a very very nice guy, and just sold him to me at a price I could afford. Um, and so we've been wrangling since. Uh, and the first news little article came out, and it didn't really get out of Montana. It was just a local one, and we thought that would probably be the end of that. And then, uh, of course, the guy from Spokane called, and he wanted to do a second article on a different photograph and all that. And then his article is the one that got picked up uh, everywhere. <laughs> so, and then wow. it you were a wrangler taking trail rides out, probably making not a lot of money, and now you're going to be on Letterman. Yes, that is that is the case. Um, it's been a, a major a major turnaround. <laughs> so, are you going to take Tonk on Letterman too? We were just talking about um, how Snowman, the show jumper, was brought into the Tonight Show. So, are you going to take Tonk on stage? Um, I, I, we're working on it. We're not sure yet. I'm, I actually have a phone meeting with the producers this afternoon um, to talk about all of that. They're getting some logistical issues worked out on getting him from Montana to New York. 
Um, but that's, of course, doable, and luckily Tonk is a, a very good hauler. He's, uh, he doesn't mind travel too bad. So if he does come on the show, uh, there's an option to have him on stage, and then there's an option to pre-film a segment with him outside. Uh, so those are both options. But I, I believe he'd go on the stage, and he'd probably be a complete ham. He, he loves attention and treats. <laughs> so. <laughs> he probably has the personality of most Bertrands, which is pretty, pretty laid back and, and pretty happy to please. So that's yeah. terrific. I, you know, i got to ask you, and there, anybody that's been in a car accident will relate to this. Once you've been in a car accident, immediately after the car accident, your stomach feels like it's through your feet. Did you have, were you that way when, you know, when you picked up that boy and you got away from the bear and you realized what had happened? Were you shaking? Were you, were you a mess? I had, yes, I had probably the largest adrenaline rush I've ever had in my life. I, I felt, it wasn't so much like a car crash. I felt that. It was more like bungee jumping. Um, <laughs> that's really how I felt afterward. It was just like, Oh my God! Did that just happen? Um, and it, it it all turned out well, so it was it was it was okay. But it was very very crazy. I was shaking and I couldn't sit down for hours. Uh, everyone was like, "Oh, just sit down and relax now and calm down." And I was like, "That's not possible." Um, <laughs> not I was happening. very. Uh, the adrenaline kept pumping for several hours, I think. And, and so. how happy was that California dad to see you and the sun ride up? He was extraordinarily happy because he had been right behind his son when the bear came, and his horse had not agreed to stay like Tonk had. His horse, uh, Tank, actually, had headed back to the barn with the rest of the, the, the seven horses, and he had managed to get uh, about halfway back to the barn and he managed to get his horse stopped, and he just hopped off his horse at that point and let his horse go um, so that he could start running back up the trail on foot to try to come find his son. Uh, but, of course, we, we met him before he, he got that far, uh, and he was so relieved to see his son. And then, unfortunately, his poor wife, who had their younger son back at the corral because their youngest son was too young to go on the ride, he's only three, so they were back at the corral, and she watched her husband's horse, completely empty, come back to the barn. <laughs> oh, no. So that was very scary for her. She had to wait probably a good 10 to 15 minutes for us to recollect and, and come back to the corral. So during that time, she had no idea where her husband or son were. And so she was pretty oh. pretty scared, um, I, yeah. I can imagine. And um, she was very relieved to to see us when we got back. <laughs> oh, I can't even imagine the, the fear of a mother. But So uh, getting back to, to Tonk, to say the, the season ends, there's no more trail rides to do. Where would you have gone and where would Tonk have gone if you hadn't have bought him? Um, if I hadn't bought Tonk, he would be headed back to Scott's farm in Wyoming. Uh, Scott actually does um, a lot of hunting. He's one of the biggest hunting outfitters in Wyoming. And so Tonk's job in the fall would have been to carry hunters into the backcountry uh, looking for, you know, elk, moose, things like that. And he'd have done that through the end of November, and then he would have gone to pasture with the rest of his herd uh, until spring of next year, in which, when he would have come back to us. And so, where is but, he going to okay. go now? And where is he going to um, go now? He and his uh, his best friend Elio. That's I guess another new part of the story. My my best friend Kristen, who works at the corral with me, ended up buying her Wrangler horse for the year too, which ironically is just Tonk's best friend. He's from Wyoming too, so she bought Elio. So Elio and Tonk, uh, we've arranged to have a nice uh, six acre pasture that they're going to have privately to themselves. It's real close to where I live in the winter, and they're going to hang out there and be pleasure horses and go exploring with Kristen and I this fall in Montana and just have fun. And Yay! Be pampered. Because <laughs> <laughs> these regular horses, I mean, you know, and then they they lug around big the hunter guys and equipment all winter. You know, they work very, very hard. And they do. Just, They're hardworking horses. Yeah, they really are, and I just am so excited that Tonk, you know, is going to be rewarded uh, by having you. Now, 
how did you get rewarded at the end of this? Um, well, I, they certainly gave me a good tip, although that was the last <laughs> thing on my yeah, mind. But they, they certainly <laughs> did give me a good tip. Um, and my my employers were very supportive and very happy and everything and were very appreciative of what I've done. And, uh, of course, they, they want me to come back next year and, uh, <laughs> and all that, of course. So, um, other than that, I guess Tonk is my biggest reward. I, I've, the, the opportunity to, to purchase and own him is, is the biggest reward I've had out of this. And I'm really looking forward to having him this fall and, it's going to be great. <laughs> well, well you are, the name. I was Go just ahead, going John. to tell her that, you know, you just truly are a hero in our minds. You, you, we've all, we've all ridden. We've all ridden in the woods. We've all had that experience where the horse turns around on us. And for you to do what you did, and I'm sure you did it without even really thinking about it, but, uh, good job and congratulations. And what a, what a wonderful thing you did. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm giving you, you know a big old hug. Think about it. <laughs> uh, well, I just, I, I just knew what I had to do. There was, there was no choice in my mind. Um, and, and, I, and I think, I think any of my wranglers that I work with at Swan Mountain would have, would have done the same thing if they could have. Um, well, if well, we ever please... go out there, we're going to Swan Mountain, Jamie. We're going to yeah. ride to yes. Swan Mountain. They have the best yes. wranglers. Anyone who's in Montana, we definitely would love you to come ride at Swan Mountain. Uh, we actually have five corrals in the state, uh, so we uh, can accommodate uh, people no matter where they're visiting, usually around the glacier or uh, swan areas. So we would love to see people out there. <laughs> What's their website? Um, SwanMountainOutfitters.com. Okay, everybody, go if you're going to go up there, go ahead and uh, go to Swan Mountain Outfitters, and then you can go ahead and request to be on Erin's ride because she'll save you from bears. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm located at the West Glacier Corral. Uh, but of course, if you call them, they, they know that. Um, uh, but I'm at the West Glacier well, Corral. We then have three that are inside the park, and then we have our one that goes into the Bob Marshall Wilderness down in the Swan Valley. You know, Jamie, you can well, look at that another way, and you could say, don't ask for Erin because hers is the ride that finds the bears. <laughs> you could look at that another way. <laughs> You can't say that. <laughs> uh, it was actually funny. We have five wranglers that are corral, and two of us had the reputation of being the bear guides. It was just, of course, luck. But Brock and I saw bears almost every day for most of the beginning of the season. And then we had a wrangler, my friend Kristen, who only saw five bears the whole season. <laughs> so has, it was just, it's just luck, but... <laughs> Some people you think Brock and I must smell good. Well, <laughs> and you say that seeing five bears, only five bears, she only saw five. That would be plenty for me. I mean, one <laughs> is cool. <laughs> so, Erin, yes. congratulations for doing what you did, and you're a total hero, and we are thrilled to talk to you, and we hope we can have you on again. Uh, to, once all this calms down, I want to kind of, know what this experience led you to and, and maybe we'll talk to you before the next wrangle season kicks up and, and find out how you're doing. Helena, she is just amazing. I mean, and so much fun. It, it tells a wonderful story. And and now she's going to be on Letterman to tell her story. <laughs> I'm so glad because somebody like that, you know what, somebody like that, a horse, that's what horse people are. I love that she represents our community. And we because all like we are brave we would, souls. We all like to think we would do what she did, you know, and not turn around and run. We all like to think that we would do the right thing and do it. But I, I don't know that you ever truly know until that circumstance comes up. Now, she didn't even have time to think about it. And that's what I think makes her a hero. She wasn't out for glory. She wasn't out for fame. She was out to save an eight-year-old child from being eaten by a grizzly bear. It's, it's, there, it's snap decision-making or, you know, it's you. Yeah. And, and she's Tonk clearly very capable. God, you know, what a brave guy. Now, he's a big guy. I mean, crap, though. Money. Can you imagine Can you imagine having your rider be like, okay, you go there after that bear. Yeah. <laughs> Who's and you, I, and mad. I, I could just imagine, like, him thinking in, in his head, like, she must be high. <laughs> <laughs> but, but okay. He did, he did it. You know, I don't know if, you know, if he would have been intimidating to the bear if he'd been a small quarter horse. Because it looks like Aaron's not that big in the picture. 
Right. So, but you know, he wasn't. He's a Percheron. It looks like a full Percheron with pie plates for feet. But, Just yeah. amazing story. It's one of those stories. You, you, as she said, we this has never happened. You know, we've never had this happen. That it just was one of those circumstances that just the situation was right and it happened. But God bless her and good job, Aaron. Yeah, <laughs> and and I bet that little boy is pretty stoked too. His dad was really happy, apparently. <laughs> so that's yeah. a big tip. That's got to be hard, really, though, to <laughs> to like see your kid in mortal danger and you are heading in the other direction. Yeah, and th- you know the other horses all bolted, so they were all gone. You know, uh, what what a great story. Just one of those goosebumps stories. Dr. Rose's Remedies Skin Treatment Salve and Spray are 100% all-natural products. They are anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, antiviral, and antifungal. Dr. Rose's are made with all human-grade ingredients and are safe and effective for treatment for all manner of cuts and scrapes on your horse. And Dr. Rose's is the must-have product here at the Horse Radio Network headquarters to keep PT Scooter's delicate white pasterns free from dew poisoning and scratches. Ask for Dr. Rose's at your local tax store or feed supplier or visit them online at drrosesremedies.com. That's drrosesremedies.com. We all know the importance of deworming our horses, and Dr. Ellefson of Biomedia Equine is helping us make sure we are doing it right. Listen for his four-part series the first week of every month on this very show. I just wanted to remind everyone, if you are due for deworming, why not save a few bucks on the popular Biomedia line of wormers, including Equimax, Bimectin, Exodus, Exodus Multidose, and Equal. You can find coupons and special offers at buymediaequine.com, including a variety of rebate offers from cash to free ivermectin. You can also get up to $2 a dose back for Equimax. And while you're at Buy Media Equine, get your free horse health record keeper, and you can just download it there. Plus, learn a bunch about parasites and deworming at Buy Media. That's B-I-M-E-D-A equine.com. We at the Horse Radio Network all use Buy Media dewormers because we want the best for our horses, and we know you want the best for yours, too. Buy Media equine.com and tell them the Horse Radio Network sent you. Two weeks ago, you took the time out of your day, which took you a while, to recite a poem called I Hung Up My Bridle Today. And it was it's a terrific poem, well-written poem. And we wanted everybody to hear it because we thought that with you reading it, it would be wonderful, and it was. Um, you, had, you had, as I said, you had Jamie and, and Jennifer crying on the morning show and, and probably everybody listening. And I want to play it for everybody again. And it only takes a couple minutes because... We have the author of that poem coming on today who was absolutely thrilled that you did it as well. Her name is Chris Garrett, and the poem is called I Hung Up My Bridle Today. I Hung Up My Bridle Today by Chris Garrett. Yesterday, for the first time, I was too tired to ride. Yesterday, for the first time, I was afraid I would be hurt if I was thrown. Yesterday, for the first time, I realized I was old. Yesterday, for the first time, I had to face that I could no longer keep up. Yesterday, for the first time, I felt my heart break. Yesterday, for the first time, I turned my back on my friend. Yesterday, for the first time, I knew I was done. Today, for the last time, I felt warm braided leather in my hands. Today, for the last time, I released the buckles on the girth and watched my girl sigh. Today, for the last time, I slowly dropped the bit so it wouldn't hit her teeth. Today, for the last time, I buried my head in her soft, warm neck. Today, for the last time, I tracked hay and horsehair into my house. Today, for the first time, I cried after my ride. Today, for the first time, I felt my hands shake as I set the saddle on its rack. Today, for the first time, I hugged my young trainer a final goodbye. Today, for the first time, I waited for the new owner's trailer to arrive. Today, for the first time, I did not hear nickering when I opened my back door. Today, for the first time, I felt worse leaving the barn 
than I did when I entered. Today, for the first time, I had no one to check on before going to bed. Tomorrow, for the first time, I can stay in bed longer. Tomorrow, for the first time, I won't be able to fly on four legs. Tomorrow, for the first time, I will regret letting her go. Tomorrow, for the first time, I will be angry at myself. Tomorrow, for the first time, I will cry the day away. Tomorrow, for the first time, I will be glad to die. Day after tomorrow, for the first time, I will know I was wrong. Day after tomorrow, for the first time, I will defy all the opinions. Day after tomorrow, for the first time, I will ignore my old bones. Day after tomorrow, for the first time, I will bring my friend home. Day after tomorrow, for the first time, I will be reborn. For the rest of my life, I will have a horse in my yard. For the rest of my life, I will ignore the well-meaning advice. For the rest of my life, I will bury my face in her soft neck. For the rest of my life, I will let my soul fly. For the rest of my life, I will never be alone. Welcome, Chris. I'm really happy to have you here because I have a gazillion questions about your beautiful poem. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm honored to be here. So, you know, I think some of the best written works come from people who are really feeling them at the moment that the pen touches the paper. Um, what, what inspired you to write this poem? What happened? Well, like so many people today, I was going through a very rough time in, on many fronts. Uh, financially, uh, our business had just tanked along with the rest of the economy. And at that time, my husband had been diagnosed with cancer, and I was just really struggling. And we have, uh, we've raised on delusions for the past 10 years. And I realized when things were just getting out of hand, I just wasn't able to keep up with everything because we do all our own work, including our own collecting and, and breeding and all of that here right at our own uh, by ourselves and I thought oh I'm just overwhelmed I've got to let these horses go I just can't do this and we were afraid of losing our farm and it was just such a rough time so I had put an ad on the internet and a local gal had called about our young stallion Grandezo and she came out to see him and when I went out to the driveway this beautiful young lady in this fancy BMW steps out in her perfectly coiffed hair and her shiny new boots. And I thought, <laughs> as I stood there in my grubby tennis shoes and jeans and my hair a mess, I thought, oh, gosh, this is not going to go well. <laughs> and she came in and, you know, she was polite and everything, but I could just see the look in her eyes because, you know, my place had just I, I had spent so much time at the hospital with my husband. I mean, my horses never went out for a moment without food or, or water or care, but I was not keeping up with the repairs and the cleaning and everything. It was just, you know, throw the hay and run to the hospital. Right. And my horse had not been ridden in quite a while, and I did have my young trainer come over. See, my voice shakes just talking about it because it was such a hard time. Nah. <laughs> See, it really was from the heart because I was just falling apart. But my trainer came and rode him for her, and he was really fresh and was a little bucky, you know, not nothing really bad. He was never a bad boy. He was just really fresh. And she looked at me and says, you know, this horse is not ready to be shown to the public. And she got in her car and sped down the driveway and then sent me this just really nasty email about what a horrible person I was and being <sighs> so fragile anyway. <laughs> Boy, I can't believe I'm still crying about this. This was two years ago. <laughs> well, go ahead. We'll all just cry with you. It's okay. <laughs> it's a family show. No, okay. Well, it's for real. <laughs> so my my mode of therapy has always been writing. It's just what I've done, you know, just um, my stories and, and poetry has always just been my way of getting out what's inside of me. So I started writing this poem, and I was thinking about my mare, Lumina, who was the first Andalusian I ever had. Oh, I just love with all my heart. And uh, I was imagining selling her. I did not actually sell her, which the poem would indicate, but I was imagining it in my mind of her driving away. And I thought, you know, I just need to let him go. I'm getting older. I'm 53. My husband's dying. My house is about to go into foreclosure. 
what do you do? I just got to let them go. And so I started writing that poem. And then the more I wrote, the more I thought, damn it, I am not quitting. I am, I am not a quitter. My husband is not going to die. I am not giving up my home. I am not giving up my horses. So it really was the truth in my heart, what I wrote, that I went through this. I was ready to just walk away from it all. And then by the time I finished that poem, an hour later, I was like, standing up with my fist in the sky, saying, damn it, God, you got to help me because this is not okay. I, I am not that old. I am not giving up my horses. I am not giving up my home. And you know what? I didn't. And my husband is fine. He's doing oh. great. He's oh, amen. <laughs> yeah. Got through the surgery. You know, he's he's home. Um, I still have my Lumina. I did sell that that beautiful young stallion. I mean, stallions are a lot of work. And I just thought, you know, without uh, without having a... Uh, the backing that I felt I needed, I just needed to let him go, which I did. And he's now a very happy riding gelding. Um, yeah. I miss him greatly, but I'm not I'm not sorry that he's got a new home. But I still have my Lumina, and I still ride, and I'm so grateful I didn't give up. But I tell you, it was a really rough go there for a while. And it made me realize how important it is that we stand in our own truth and not let the judgment of others affect the decisions we make in our life. You know, you have to look at it, but... Uh, it was a real turning point in my life. And I think it will be a pivot point for a lot of other people as well, because I think sometimes the hardest part about going through things like that, what you went through is that feeling of, I can't do this. I'm by myself. I can't, yeah. I can't do it. I can't do it. And when you know that someone else has gone through it and survived it, you don't feel so alone. And somehow that gives you the strength, even if it's, you know, looking up to God or looking over to your next door neighbor or listening to a silly little podcast and a beautiful poem. It it just gives you that companionship that you need at those lowest points. And so the fact that you put this down and put it out there, I, that's paying it forward. Like, thank you, because I'm going to keep this tucked in my barn. In a, you know, in a warm and cozy little place, seriously, because, you know, I've had times like that, too. And what do you reach for? You know, you reach for your bridle, you reach for your brushes, you reach for a little poem tucked behind the hay bales. <laughs> yeah, it is interesting with the the advent of all the social media. I, I never had any idea that so many people felt the same way. And that poem has just gone all over the world. It was published in Australia and it came back to me from someone as a greeting card and with my name <laughs> off of it, of course, and they didn't even know I'd written it. And I thought that was just so funny. So I really have enjoyed watching it go all over the place. But it's, it is true that there are so many people in the same position. And I, you know, I survived it. I still have my house. We did not lose it. I'm, I'm <laughs> amazed that we got through all that and are now on the upswing because I, I just didn't see any way out. And there was that point. I'm not a particularly religious person. I don't even claim a particular religion, but I am a, a very spiritual person. And there was a point where I just said, you know, me, the person, the ego self, Chris can't do this. I just don't know what to do. And I just mm. give up the spirit and I'll just, you know, follow the popcorn that spread my way and, right. and, and see what happens. And all the interesting things and synchronicities that occurred uh, over the last two years that have allowed us to save our house. And, and, it's, and it's safe now, you know, I'm, and my horses are safe and I'm still here and I'm still riding and I still have my bridle and I still have my little friend trader who still comes over. <laughs> and I thought, wow, two years ago, I thought I would be you know, living in a tent um, uh, all by myself somewhere in the Rocky Mountains. <laughs> I just didn't see any way out. And you know what? There are things that show up that you just can't even imagine are going to show up if you can just hang in there and just and just ask for help when you need it and also trust that there is help out there that you may not be able to see. So, yeah, interesting. Well, yeah, I'll you... tell you, I found that you were saying about social media. <clears throat> I saw that first. You had me all choked up. I saw that first on Facebook, and when I saw the name, I went, I think I know that person. And it also goes to show how small the horse world is. Did you actually put this out two years ago, and it's just making its way around again? Yes. Yeah. This, it, it took two years to get to whatever Facebook page you found on it. I mean, it's still just bopping around. So. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It was the end of 2009 when I wrote that, yeah. Well, I tell you, I, Helena did a wonderful job with it, too. I knew that... Of all, 
Everybody I knew, I knew that Helena could do it, but I also knew that it was going to take her a while, and she just told everybody earlier in the show that it took her a few takes to get that, get through it without crying. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was big because it's, it does. It comes from a very real place. It comes from a very, very real and practical place. I, it's not something, these kinds of feelings are not something that just a few of us feel. I think they're feelings that everybody feels at some point in their well, their and life. I think it's a fear of every horse person, and it's, I think especially Ugh. horse women. I think it's a fear that one day they're going to be the person in this poem, yeah, and yeah. that's a fear that every horse person has. That I'm not going to be able to afford my horse someday, and I'm going to be the person in this poem. I just had a good friend that uh, uh, we hang out with, and she said, "You know, we're going through a tough time financially. I think I'm going to have to sell my horse. It's her only horse, and she's in her twenties." And, you know, I said to her, I said, make that the last thing you do. And then when I saw her a couple weeks later, I said, did did you sell your horse? And she said, no. She said, I thought about what you said, and I would be devastated without my horse. My horse helps me get through, so we cut some other things out. And I think you you hit a spot, a nerve, that every horse person fears with that poem. And it is a fear thing, especially when you're responsible for these lives. And, yeah, they are expensive. Nobody can deny that. And when we were really in the worst of it, we had a, a wonderful hay guy that was trading everything from my husband's gun collection to bicycles for hay. I mean, we just mm. we would make sure they were fed long before we would feed ourselves. You know, we were just determined they're not going to ever go hungry. And I know there are people who have gone that, through that kind of thing before and it is a fear because you are responsible for some very expensive lives but for those of us who are longtime equestrians and, and like I said I'm 53 I got my first when I was nine I have never been without them the thought of life without them you know really looking at it I thought this isn't just a hobby this isn't just even a lifestyle this is my soul these these and, and yeah. to a non-horse person, I don't know how you possibly explain that because to someone to whom they don't connect, they just can't feel the depth of those of us who are who are who live our life through our horses and who our horses are as part of much part of our life as our own children. It isn't an option to give them up. It just isn't. I mean, in some way, you're going to have horses in your life, and uh, I'm just so grateful that I didn't give up at the time and uh, that I'm still here with them now <laughs> we're grateful you didn't give up too <laughs> we are because it's so nice to hear that that decision that you made to not give up has brought you to such a great place like you're you're in a good place now and yeah it, i don't think that's just pure luck you know well i it, believe that you get whatever you concentrate on and it's right i just gone to the place of i give up and we're done and my husband's gonna die and we're gonna lose our house that would have happened but just that sense of determination, I think, has really has really changed things. It's like, um, you, I'm not sure where you saw the poem, may have been on Jane Savoy's site, but I, I do work, do some part-time work for her, which was the result of just not giving up. And she offered me a part-time job, and it was like, oh, my gosh, I get to work for Jane Savoy. <laughs> it's like it's really the most <laughs> amazing thing. No one could ever have told me that someday that would happen. I may remember 20 years ago getting her first book, uh, that way I'm feeling and thinking this is this is the woman for me. I love her. And I had told my husband if there was anybody on the planet I could interview, it would be Jane Savoy. Somebody would have told me that I'd be working for her someday. I would just, I'd say, oh, yeah, sure, right. <laughs> <laughs> and here I am, you know, and I'm just so honored to have that. And, you know, it's amazing the connections that happen when you just have that forward energy and forward motion happening. You just don't give up and, and visualize what it is that you want and keep on moving your feet. And, you know, there are powers that be, I really believe. I don't know what they are. I have no real powerful sense of what spirit is, but I do know that there's got to be power beyond just me that helped guide this to the right place. Well, and I wanted to clarify for anybody that doesn't know, Jane Savoy's actually been on our show a few times in our other shows, and she, of course, is the queen of dressage here in the United yes. States. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, she uh, does... She does uh, clinics, and she has books, and she has a terrific websites. She just does so much for the for riders and the world of dressage here and has a lot of new projects going on. You're working on one of the new projects, right? Yes, I am. Actually, uh, do you want me to go into that a little bit? Yeah, or? why don't you tell us? Is it, you're doing the Riding Light, right? Riding Light, yeah. yeah. This this came from um, a response to one of Jane's Motivation for Moshi posts where Moshi talked about, 
hey, you know what, even if you got some heavy, some few pounds extra or whatever, get on, go ride anyway, you know, and it was kind of like my thing with the just being too old and too whatever to not ride anymore. And this is, you know, we're all getting older and a lot of us have the middle age spread and some of us feel very self-conscious about riding because of our weight. And um, when Jane posted that, the response was unbelievable all over the world. And, you know, Jane is international. Emails came in, and I, I do help answer her email. So I see these people saying, holy cow, I can't believe you actually touched on this touchy subject, and I have been I have been just browbeat by my trainer, and I have been humiliated at clinics about my weight, and I just finally, now I don't ride anymore because I think I'm too fat. And on, um, thank you so much for touching on this taboo subject. And Jane, who does not have a weight issue, was so surprised, and she talked to me about it, and I do have a lot. I'm carrying around a whole lot of extra weight, and she said, holy cow, is this really true? Do trainers really do that? Because Jane is such a sweet person. She would never do that to anyone. She would never be that humiliating. And, and there are trainers who are really nasty, and I've, I've had a couple of those myself. And uh, I said, oh, yeah, Jane, it's very, very common. You would, you'd would you be surprised if you haven't seen it. You'd be surprised how many trainers will really shred their their clients. You've never had any of those, have you, Helena? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, do you know what I'm talking about? You know, it's, it's think, really hard. I think we it's, both know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Jane said, you know, we talked about it, and she said, well, maybe we really need to touch on this because it isn't about the number of pounds. What it really is is about the way you ride. And, you know, a really light person can be very abusive to a horse's back and mouth, and a really heavy person might be a very elegant rider. She says it's not about the number of pounds. It's about how you ride, and it's about being fit. I mean, it, this is a sport, and it does take a level of fitness, and the, depending on the discipline you do, like it's not going to take as much fitness to walk down a trail, or as a trail as it is to, you know, do an eventing course or something, but it, it is still a sport. So, so we talked about, let's develop a program that isn't about the pounds, but is about how to ride in a way that's light for the horse, and how to get fit in a comfortable, happy way. And so she and I have been developing a program uh, along with a, a personal trainer, and uh, we're going to do the Equi-Chi, which is Tai Chi for horse people, uh, and that's equi-chi.com if you want to look at that, um, on getting core strength and letting go of this this mental monsters of the the how I look in the saddle, you know, because there's an awful lot of us that don't ride in front of other people because, you know, we've been told we don't look good enough in the saddle. Well, that's just wrong, and it's just a shame. And, you know, when you can see a 200-pound man win a championship on a 14-3 rainer, and that's okay, but a 200-pound woman is too fat to even get on the, you know, the 16-hand warm blood. I mean, what, what? There's a problem there. That doesn't compute. I mean, a horse isn't gonna, uh, a heavy woman isn't gonna feel heavier than an average-sized man. You know, it just doesn't make any sense logically. This is a, this is a aesthetic issue more than a pounds issue, and we are still going to address the fitness issue. So. Um, and when, soon, is this out now, or will uh, we're still working on it? I'm okay. actually editing the DVDs right now, so I'm hoping that they'll be out by Christmas, and it'll be at ridinglight.com, and that's riding-light.com, L-I-G-H-T. Okay. And uh, it's going to be a DVD series along with the Equity and uh, uh, Horseman Fitness training, as well as Jane explaining how you can, if you're a heavy person, how you can ride lighter for your horse, as well as saddle fit, you know, all the little things that we can do to make the horse more comfortable. And we're also going to address the emotional issues, which is something that Jane is so good at. And of course, you can tell I'm a very sensitive person. So uh, <laughs> I, I get to address a lot of the emotional <laughs> stuff because I live it and I write for my heart. So um, <laughs> there will be a book called Writing Light coming out soon, too. So, Well, when you get yeah. all that ready in, in uh, around Christmas time, let us know when the website's up and everything's ready to go. Let us know and we'll have you and Jane both back on. Oh, that would be wonderful. All yeah, right, We cool. would love to share that. Yeah. Well, Chris, this I, I'm so glad. One first and foremost, I'm glad to hear your husband is back home and and doing okay. Um, Me too. Thanks. <laughs> let's let's hope that that continues for yeah. many 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 more years to come, um, and that that he's with you to guide you because, geez, girl, you you need help there. 
Uh, <laughs> we do. We have a lot of horses still. <laughs> you got all those Andalusians <laughs> hanging around. And those Andalusians don't tend to be small pony size. So, uh... No, they're pretty good size. Yeah. <laughs> Congratulations you... on, on being able to keep your place. And it sounds like you're in a better spot. You're working for a, for a, a good lady. And I just am I'm so happy for you. And it's, it's good to know that a poem that makes people cry that the person who wrote it has a, had a good ending here. So Yes, so well, thank you again. It did turn out well. So. <laughs> well, thank you, Chris. We appreciate it. And you have a copy of the final one with the music in it and everything, right? I sure do. Thank okay. you. Yes. Yeah, feel free to use that wherever. I don't. I, I think Helena would be thrilled if you did. Okay, I'll do it. Thank you. I'm going to put it on my website. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, okay, Chris. Thank Take you. good care. I will. You too. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you go. That was, uh, you know, she. What a story! Boy, it had me crying. I had to put my mute on. I was, I had, I was just listening. I put my mute on too and was just listening to her go. <laughs> just go. I, well, first of all, she's easy to listen to. She's well spoken. Right. She's genuine, and it, this turned out to be great. Like, I, I, I'm really, I have nothing to say because she said it all. I know, it's, and we've all, you know, we've all been where she is in the past, and and we all have that fear of going there again. Um, so she just hit the heart with that one. Good job, Chris, in, in, in writing that and sharing it with everybody. And the fact that she's hooked up with Jane Savoy now, you know, it's true. The, the universe has a, a way of exerting itself on you, you know? It's like you just kind of throw I your hands up and say, me. <laughs> the universe <laughs> has a sense that. of humor. The universe has a sense of humor. Don't answer that. <laughs> uh, well, right, we it's... are grateful to Chris. <laughs> And we'll look for more poems. Hopefully, she'll write a few more. Yeah, Maybe I'm happier post ones. Post that uh, sound file up on on Stable Scoop by itself. So, if people want to share that, they can as well. Um, all right, very good. Then it, it, we are off to Tack and Habit time, and this is sponsored by Kentucky Performance Products. When you're looking for a supplement for your horse, we want you to stop by kppusa.com first. They have the supplements that you're going to want or need for your horse. They cover the whole gambit from from joints to stomach problems to digestion issues, whatever you need, whether it's your horse is a little hyper or not not up enough or whether your horse has weight problems, just like we were talking about there for humans, you're going to find what you need at Kentucky Performance Products. They're in many stores nationwide, but you're going to find most of the information you want about their products at their website. It's kppusa.com. That's kppusa.com for the supplement that you need for your horse. Well, today's Tack and Habit, uh, we recorded at the Ada when we were there the last time. And if you remember right, Helena, for another Tack and Habit episode, we talked about a website called My Saddle Trader. Yes. Yep. I remember it. Well, My Saddle Trader is still around and has tons more saddles on it. And they had a new person in charge of the operation. So we managed to catch up with her and get an update on MySaddleTrader.com. So that's what we're going to do right now. Well, Jamie and I are here at the American Equestrian Trade Association show, and we recorded this little segment for the morning show because we thought you guys would like to hear from Kim because she has a pretty cool cool uh, technology thing that she does, and you found it yesterday, and you just took a – you saw saddles, and that was it. You were there. Well, the cool thing about this is it is called MySaddleTrader.com, and it is a place where you can go on and you can look for – New saddles, used saddles from dealerships. From, from I'm going to let you explain, actually, Kim, what it is and why I, I think it's so exciting. Okay, well, thanks, guys. I really appreciate you having me on. Um, well, listening to the saddle retailers at the trade shows for the last 10 years, I realized that there needed to be an, uh, a, an even playing field for the dealers and the manufacturers to compete with other stores. So what we did was we wanted to figure out an optimized search engine for them to go on to the internet, um, put in exactly what they're looking for, and be able to connect to the manufacturers and dealers of the the saddles. So with an optimized search engine that we developed, they go on, they fill out a form, and that takes them to the dealers and manufacturers that have what they're looking for, instead of spending hours um, on the internet looking for something different. Now, it's new and used saddles? New, used, and consigned saddles. Um, 
So if I want, if I'm a, if I am an event rider and I want a dressage saddle, I can go on there and I can do a search for a specific. You can. You can go by brand. You can go by discipline. You can go by saddle size. Um, you can get as as optimized as you can be. As specific as you are will take you there. If you want to do a general search, you can also do that, and that's still going to line up what you're looking for. So when, you know, being in the market for a saddle in the past. And She's actually, always in the market for a saddle. I need, I need a new dress, so I'll <laughs> that, honey. Um, being in the market for that, this is a place you can go on, and it's kind of like, you know, where you sell your horse. It's like a horse, but it's saddles. So exactly. you can look. There's different pictures on there. There's mm-hmm. all the angles, the sizes, the write-ups, and it's mysaddletrader.com, kind of like, you know, the truck trader or auto trader. It, that's what we compare it to is the auto trader because a lot of people understand that, um, and we say it's exactly the same thing. You, you put in what you're looking for, and boom, you're going to get it. It's just a quicker way and less time-consuming to find what you're looking for. And this could be across different you, – you're going to get – they're going to be able to compare all the different makes and models of saddles from different manufacturers – Different places that they're for sale. Exactly, yes. And used ones, too. Exactly. And the manufacturers go on, and they can actually go on to their sites and update their sites. So people on My Saddle Trader, my saddle trader um, will be able to see some of the new things out probably for the general public. Yeah. Um, because then we're hooked up right to the manufacturers. Now, what I found also interesting about this is that this is a family business. It is. Right? My uh, dad, Sam, or Jim Putnam. Uh, he developed saddle stackers first um, and then was trying to find a, a way to market saddle stackers, and he developed this website. Um, then I came on, and I'm running the website, and it is doing both for – it's working for both companies. Yeah, so it's great. And so basically you spend a heck of a lot of time with your dad. A lot of time. <laughs> yeah, a lot of time. <laughs> you probably get a little frustrated. He seems to be a nice guy. He is. He's very easy to work with, and he's a genius. No. Um, he does come up with these concepts, and they're great concepts. Yeah. How many saddles? I mean, I, I would assume that it's much like a horse sale uh, online, you have to have stuff to sell, and mm-hmm. you have to have people interested. How many people do you, I would imagine it was a pretty slow process, but how many people, uh, how many saddles do you have on there right now? Well, when we started out, we were number 600 on Google for used saddles. As of this morning, we're number three. Yay! So that's a really big thing. Um, when we started out, we were pretty small. Now we have over 1,200 saddles. We have 75 manufacturers, and we now have over 100 dealers on our website. So I go online, I see a saddle I like, and I click on it. Do I buy the saddle through you, or do you send me to that site? It, yeah, we have no. We have, there's no money between the, the consumer and us. We're a middleman, mm-hmm. and when you hit that button to contact seller, you directly go to their website. You can either call them, you can email them, or you can talk to them directly. Now, how much does it cost? Up until January, it's going to be free. Um, Free. While we're building our site and, you know, making sure there's no... That's way too expensive. I know. That's why we're telling everyone, jump on now. You're going to have free advertising through the Christmas season, which is perfect. Um, And then in January, we're going to contact people and say, hey, what do you think? You guys want to stay on? And then we have some packages set up that are very affordable for everyone. I mean, so, okay... I am an individual, and I would like to put my saddle up there. After January, how much is that going to cost me? It'll be between two ninety nine and six ninety nine a month, and that's because you can do either one right. You can do one or five different photos. Thinking about a classified ad in your local paper uh, or wherever you are going to put a classified ad with photos would be a lot more than a that, lot more so. money. And this is dedicated solely to selling saddles only. Yeah. So if you want to put your, you know, it would be like putting your cat on a dog page. You know, you put your saddle on a saddle page, right. you're going to get people that are looking for that saddle. And you've I come in it. at a good time, too, now, because... So many people are getting away from eBay. It's just such a pain in the butt. Well, eBay, yeah. you, you, you get. <clears throat> yeah, it's sometimes just a pain. they say it's one thing, and you get some pretty crap quality. Right. And I've been burned on eBay. I mean, how, you, you can get burned on eBay so easy. So this is like a legitimate. And you've checked out the people that are selling mm-hmm. it. They're well, they're actual tax stores. Yeah. you know, they're brick and mortar. Um, and that's one of our criteria is that you are a legitimate business, and we do check them out. Not any, not just anyone can come on to mysaddletrader.com. Mm-hmm. All right. That's terrific. We appreciate you being here, Kim. Thank you so much for asking us. We really appreciate it. That wasn't so bad, was it? (laughs) (laughs) She just rolled her eyes at me. (laughs) Thank you very much for coming by. Thanks, guys. Well, that's mysaddletrader.com. Go check it out. 
I have another suggestion, too. Uh, I didn't know whether to put this as my tech pick of the week, so I'm going to do that. My tech pick of the week this week, Helena, is it's that time of year when you should be getting your fall vaccinations for your horses. And sometimes all the different vaccines you can get are confusing, and your vet will tell you you need all of them, and it's going to cost you $400. And, and you need to figure out what you need and be, be you know, learn this stuff yourself so that, you, one, you're not taken advantage of, but, two, that you're sure you're doing the right thing by your horse. And there's a great resource, great website. It's at the AEEP, AAEP, I can never say that. American AAAAAA, BCDEFG. It's the Vets Association. And they have a terrific page on there which talks about the really mandatory vaccinations and then the ones that are risk-based, depending on where you live and what you're in contact with, that kind of thing. And they explain it all. It's done very well. And we're going to put the link to that in our show notes at Stable Scoop because we just, I just thought it was a terrific link for really learning about, about what you need for your vaccines. And that's something, you know, a lot of people are starting to do it now. Some have done it. We, uh, next time the vet comes out, Beaker's going to get his done. And I don't know, do you do yours yourself or do you have the vet out? I just had the vet out on Friday. Yeah. So that, yeah, they did. And, but they keep track of everything. <laughs> so we, we decide together what we need. And then in the spring or in the fall, and then we sort of say, okay, we're going to, you know, we're going to continue that each year unless they're going to compete or something like that. But, um, but I would love to have, but of course I always forget. So the vet yeah. shows up and I'm doing a million things and he's like, we're doing flu and rhino. Right. And I'm like, uh, yeah. Did we add anything else to that? What can we add? So it's really, you know, again, practical life means you forget when the, the moment someone asks you right. for the answer to that question, you totally forget the answer. So I would really love to have a, an app like this. Yeah. yeah, so there's a good guide there at the aaep.org site, and we're going to post that link on our Facebook page. Plus, I'm going to give a free plug to one of our sponsors on our other shows, and that's Pocket Stable. If you want to keep track of all of that, what, what vaccinations you've had, when the farrier's been there last, when you had the dental done last, your horse's weight, Pocket Stable is a cool little application for an iPhone. If you have an iPhone, it's three dollars and ninety nine cents, and it keeps track of all of that, and it will remind you when they're due. You put what? a due date in, and it, it put, gives your phone little reminders when they're due. I need those remind. I need to, I need a phone I know. <laughs> that has like Wait, a rubber mallet that bangs me on the head. <laughs> the farrier, call the hay guy. Oh, that reminds me, I got to call the hay guy. There I gotta you rest. go. <laughs> you know, I was on hey, my way get back it from now because hay's going to be very expensive this year. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I got to call George, my hay guy. Yeah. Do you believe that I had a hundred bales delivered in March and I'm just out now? Well, wow. Well, they, you, know, you had good grass all summer, though. You we had did pretty good grass. grass. Yeah. yeah, it was a good year down here for grass too. But I'm telling everybody, go out and get your hay now for the winter. Buy it now. It's not going to get cheaper this year. And your shavings, because if and you know this is something that I learned that we don't have a lot of storage space here on my small farm, but. Um, it's funny that you can make storage space when you really need to. And if only saving in the cost of like oil and like who knows what's going to go on in the Middle East and politically and stuff. And so I think some of the key prices and things or the prices on key items in the horse world are going to go up. One of which is gasoline. Yes. And so we're going to have fuel charges. So if you can eke out a little extra storage space in your farm, you know, with your, your fall or winter order, do it. Because I think it'll save you money. Do it now when there's, you know, not a heck of a lot going on. I totally agree. And part yeah. of the reason that the hay shortage, of course, is the fires in Texas. Uh, they have lost most of their hay crop because they've had the drought down there. So a lot of hay is being shipped to Texas right now from all over the country. Right. Uh, their round bale prices went from forty dollars to one hundred and fifty per round. Whoa! For one round bale. Um, so they're paying upwards to twenty dollars a bale for square bales. God. Poor Texas. <laughs> you know that what's going to happen is the hay dealers are going to go, oh, I can make more money shipping it to Texas. So um, get, you yeah. know, get your hay orders in now. Don't put that one off this year. You'll pay no, for it if you do. No, no. And shavings. Get your stuff as, as much as you can or buddy up with a neighbor or something. You know, this something I learned. Um, I had to say something about uh, bugs, flies. Bugs, Was it flies. Bugs, flies. Fortunately, ours are starting to end here, thank God. Oh, no, ours are like, well, yeah, they're starting to end, but you know what happens right before they end. Yeah, yeah they, they, they decide that when they're going to buzz around you, they're going to do Ugh. it in the most annoying fashion possible. I've actually, the weather has been so beautiful here, and I've actually had my horses inside during the day for the last two days. 
because they are nothing I spray on them. And it's been too warm here. It's been in like the 70s and 80s. So, you, you better know, enjoy that while you can. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I, I put a fly sheet and mask on pie and the poor thing was all lathered up and totally aggravated. So I said, you're better off just staying inside. I put the fan on, gave him a little hay. The two of them were like, ooh, this is the Ritz. <laughs> what do we do to deserve this? And then they go out at night and they get into trouble. For details about today's show, we'll put the links and everything at StableScoop.com or become our friend on Facebook under StableScoop uh, or on Twitter at Horse Radio. And we want to thank our sponsors, Equestrian Collections, Uncle Jimmy's, and Kentucky Performance Products. And don't forget to visit all the other great shows on the Horse Radio Network at HorseRadioNetwork.com. There's nine of them, so check them out. If you haven't listened to anything but Stable Scoop, maybe give another one of them a try. Um, what else? And, you know, I want to especially plug the uh, Horse Tip Daily Show. Since my wife took over as hosting that two months ago, the numbers have gone up 20%. <laughs> She's awesome. Jennifer is awesome. It does I not know. surprise me. So, it's my favorite show on the network. Obviously, Sorry, everybody else. It is so my favorite. Do you like it since she took over? I love it. She's Absolutely much more insightful and knows more than I do. So it's much better that she's doing that show. She is, I t- you know, and she used to get mad at me because I would call her a freak of nature. She is a walking encyclopedia of horse knowledge. Yep. And she's, you know, she's done a great job with it. So good job to my wife uh, for replacing me on Horse Tip Daily pretty soon. She's going to replace me on all the shows. And then the numbers are up 20%. <laughs> That's Coach Jen with Horse Tip Daily. It's the only other show you will find me proactively promoting on Stable Scoop. (laughs) Or Stip Daily. (laughs) All right. That's it uh, for this week, Helena. That's it. Yes. But there will be more next week.